Salwaita! Welcome back to Weekly Roman History. This is part 17 on the Flavian Dynasty. I'm Madeline Wainer. Follow me and subscribe if you like my videos. The content warning for this video is suicide. A few questions for review. First, what was the name of the first dynasty of Roman emperors? Pause here if you need to think about it. If you said Julio Claudian, you're right. The first five emperors of Rome were linked through blood or marriage to the first emperor, Augustus. Augustus was part of the Julian clan, and the rest were all part of the Claudian clan. Next, who was the last emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty? If you said Nero, good job. Nero was killed in a conspiracy, and unlike the last time that happened, he was not replaced by a family member. Speaking of which, which emperor of the same answer choices was the previous one murdered by a conspiracy? If you said Caligula, you're right. Claudius was also murdered, but by his wife, not a conspiracy. That's our review. Here's our roadmap. The year after Nero's murder, 69 CE, is a chaotic time of civil war known as the Year of the Four Emperors. Galba, Otho, and Vitellius are all murdered within months, and the last, Vespasian, establishes a new dynasty. Vespasian is a very successful emperor, and he leaves the empire to his son, Titus. Titus dies of an illness after only two years, with no heirs, so his younger brother, Domitian, takes over. Domitian has lived in his father and brother's shadow his whole life, and is paranoid and insecure. He is a mediocre emperor by most measures, but the Senate despises him. Domitian is murdered by a conspiracy and replaced by a senator, ending the Flavian dynasty. Now to the main story. At the end of the last video, Nero was deposed by a coalition of rebellious generals and replaced by Galba, who was one of those generals. This move breaks part of the spell Augustus had cast over the Roman people. Galba has no dynastic claim. He isn't a Julio-Claudian. He took power by military force, like Augustus before him. Augustus' success was in convincing the rest of the Roman world that only he and his family had a legitimate claim to rule, that his reign was based on something more than force. That's why Tacitus says that this era revealed the secret of the empire. By toppling Nero and installing himself on the throne, Galba proves that all you need is an army to become emperor, and there are lots more Romans with armies out there. Galba takes the throne in 68 CE. The previous decades under Nero were characterized by loose spending to support Nero's party boy lifestyle, and Galba wants to set things right. To balance the treasury, he confiscates many of the gifts Nero gave to high-class Romans, which doesn't win him any friends. He also doesn't bribe the Praetorian Guard. It's become customary for each emperor to pay a bribe to the Praetorians when he takes the throne to buy their loyalty. It's a nice bonus that they feel they have a right to. He also doesn't throw any public games to save money, which means the Roman people aren't fans. He sets to work trying to bring corruption under control, which irks the Senate. So he has alienated the upper class, the Praetorian Guard, the people, and the Senate. Oh, and the army feels ignored. By trying to reform too much too fast, Galba has lost all his support. On January 1st of each year, soldiers all over the empire renew their oath of loyalty to the emperor. On January 1st, 69 CE, the legions of Germany refuse to renew their oath. They cast down the images of Galba and declare their commander, Vitellius, emperor instead. It's just like the aftermath of Marius and Sulla. Once we prove that all you need to gain supreme power is military force, everyone is going to try it. But Vitellius isn't even next in line here. He's in Germany, and his troops have a long march to get to Rome. In the crisis that follows the news of their defection, another powerful man takes the opportunity to replace Galba. Otho was an ally of Galba's when he was gaining power, but also a rival. He's also the guy that Nero appointed to a governorship because he wanted to marry his wife. Otho bribes the Praetorian Guard to declare him emperor in place of Galba, and they're only too happy to do it. Galba confronts the Praetorians in the Forum in front of the people, hoping the public setting will shame them into acting right. He miscalculated. The Praetorians murder Galba in broad daylight. Otho reverses Nero's Donatio Memoriae and cozies up to Nero's remaining supporters. This allows him to claim that he was rightfully deposing a pretender and restoring Nero's rightful place. Never mind that he'd supported that pretender in the first place. Despite this bit of creative politics, Otho proves to be a fit leader, ruling well in the city. However, Vitellius's army is still marching toward Rome. Otho sends messages to Vitellius' supporters saying he'd be happy to share power with him, but Vitellius's forces don't care. They started marching toward Rome to kill an emperor, and they don't seem to care that someone else is in the position now. 
By March, Otho has to start sending soldiers out to fight Wittelius's. The battles are huge and bloody. On April 16th, seeing that he cannot win, Otho commits suicide in order to spare Rome further bloodshed. It's an inspiringly selfless move. Before his time as emperor, Otho showed signs of being exactly like Nero. In fact, his four months of rule showed that he might have been a very good leader, but we don't get to find out because now Vitellius is emperor. Vitellius, in contrast to Otho, is a worthless leader. He might even have been placed in his office because of it. There's a story that when Galba was assigning generals, he knew that the German legions would be the most likely to revolt. He chose Vitellius as someone so useless he couldn't possibly lead a successful revolt. In the event, it's his soldiers who do all the work of the rebellion. Vitellius himself hangs back behind and parties while the soldiers fight their way toward Rome. He only advances through the front lines when Otho is dead and Rome is safely his. As he tours the battlefields, he says that the only thing sweeter than the smell of a dead enemy is that of a dead fellow citizen. It might be worth reminding you that a lot of the bad details in these emperor biographies are likely to be made up. The emperor after Vitellius starts a new dynasty, so it is in his historian's interest to create a narrative in which Vitellius' death was richly deserved. But we also don't know that these things aren't true. Vitellius doesn't rule in peace for long. It's July 1st when troops in Judea declare their general Vespasian emperor. Vespasian gains the support of the generals of nearby provinces, most notably Egypt, which controls the grain supply that feeds Italy. Vespasian himself sticks around in Judea, because he doesn't want to abandon the war there against the Jews. So it's other generals allied with him in closer provinces who march to Rome and take it in fierce fighting. In one riot, Vespasian's supporters, including his younger son Domitian, hold up on the Capitoline Hill. Vitellius' supporters burn down many of the temples there, including the famous Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Domitian makes it out alive. Vitellius tries to abdicate the throne to save his life, but supporters convince him to stay. Vespasian's forces take the city two days later, on December 20th. All those supporters who convinced him to stay abandon Vitellius. Vitellius's end is particularly pathetic. He finds himself alone in the imperial palace as the rebels are breaking in, so he hides in a bedroom. He puts a mattress against the door and hides in the dirty laundry. That leads me to mourn the fall of Vitellius, the former hide-and-seek champion. And I also dearly hope that the soldier who pulled Vitellius out of the laundry looked at the metaphorical camera and said, It's laundry day. And that's the conclusion of the chaotic year of the four emperors. Vespasian's claim sticks, both because he has a big army with a lot of powerful allies, and because he manages to govern without alienating people. Alright, challenge time. Put the four emperors of the year of the four emperors in order. Pause here to consider. Okay, the lineup is... Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian. Galba was the unpopular reformer, Vitellius' armies declared him emperor, Otho took the moment to seize power himself, Vitellius' armies defeated him, and Otho sacrificed himself, but then Vespasian's army defeated Vitellius. Vespasian emerges victorious. Vespasian's full name is Titus Flavius Vespasianus, and it's his middle name, Flavius, that gives us the name of his dynasty, the Flavian dynasty. Vespasian is a different breed of emperor than we've seen so far. Where the previous emperors were upper class, Vespasian comes from a middle class background. His family were equestrians until he and his brother were added to the Senate. Most emperors had spent their lives in the city, but Vespasian's extensive military experience means he spent a lot of time in the provinces. In his early career, he showed himself an ambitious climber, more than happy to kiss up to the despotic Caligula and Nero in order to advance politically. He did get in trouble for falling asleep at one of Nero's concerts. But he had a spotless reputation as a good general, so Nero sent him to deal with the huge Jewish rebellion in Judea in 67. And that's what he was doing two years later in 69, when his troops declared him emperor. He stays in Judea until 70, then heads to Rome, leaving his older son Titus in charge of the war. Titus ends the main part of the fighting in 70 with the siege of Jerusalem. Titus destroys the great temple of Solomon that had been the most sacred site in Judaism for 2,000 years. The last ruin of it still stands as the Western Wall in Israel, which is a site of mourning for Jewish people today. Titus leaves shortly thereafter, and the last bits of resistance finally die away when a different Roman general takes the nearly invincible fort of Masada in 73. Vespasian and Titus celebrate a huge triumph that lasts 30 days. It's officially for their victory in Judea, because triumphs are for foreign wars, not civil wars. But it's clearly about both. The theme of the celebration is the Flavians restoring order to the Roman world. 
Notably, since the triumph is officially about Judea, Vespasian's younger son, Domitian, can't be honored. Domitian had been an instrumental part of the Flavian Rebellion in Rome itself, almost died on the Capitoline, and held down the fort in the year between their victory in Rome and his father returning to the city. But while Vespasian and his favored older son Titus ride in ceremonial chariots as triumphant generals, Domitian is just one of many in the parade on a plain horse. Remember this image of Vespasian sharing power and prestige with his older son Titus while snubbing his younger son Domitian. If you can remember that, you understand all three Flavian emperors. After the people-pleasing triumphal games, Vespasian settles in to the other thing emperors do to win favor with the people. He builds things. He repurposes most of the grounds of Nero's Domus Aurea, the famous palace Nero built after the Great Fire of 64. He builds a temple of peace and starts the Flavian Amphitheater. This is the first arena in Rome specifically for gladiator fighting. Before it, they used the Circus Maximus for both chariot racing and gladiator fights. There was a colossal statue of Nero on the palace grounds, and rather than tear it down, they replace the head and make it a statue of Sol, god of the sun. The statue is known as the Colossus, and it gives the Flavian Amphitheater its more famous name, the Colosseum. Vespasian starts the Colosseum, Titus finishes it, and Domitian makes improvements, like the tunnels underground that allowed animals and gladiators to appear from trapdoors. So we can thank the Flavians for one of the most iconic pieces of Roman architecture. Or, more properly, we can thank the poor conquered Jews. Titus and Vespasian plundered a lot of loot from the storming of Jerusalem, and it was Jewish riches and Jewish slave labor that built the Flavian Amphitheater. Vespasian also makes war in Gaul and Germany, because Vitellius had abandoned his post and left a power vacuum. The armies left in the provinces were mostly composed of locals, and they sided with local rebel groups and tried to throw off Roman authority. It is by now common practice to recruit locals and provinces into the Roman army, and this incident exposes the danger of that practice. Vespasian changes policy so that the soldiers in the provinces are moved to serve in areas far away from their original homes, so that they won't share a culture with any rebels they're supposed to be fighting. Between the wars and the building, Vespasian has a very expensive reign. He taxes rigorously and aggressively to pay for it. He puts taxes on things that have never been taxed before, most notably human urine. Laundry owners used to collect urine from public latrines to use to wash clothes. The ammonia in urine gets out stains. It's actually quite effective, and I believe they did rinse them afterward. Latrines are public property, so Vespasian taxes the launderers for access to the urine. There's a famous story that Titus, his favorite son, told Vespasian that taxing urine was beneath the dignity of an emperor. In response, Vespasian held up a handful of coins and asked him if any of them had any smell. This exchange is often paraphrased as, money doesn't stink. It will go to show you how pragmatic Vespasian is. He brings a no-nonsense view to the throne, a middle-class worldview to contrast the fussy obsession with decorum of the upper class. He does much to push Latin status to new cities in the provinces, opening the nobility of many different races to Roman citizenship, and democratizing the Senate a bit. Vespasian was also well known for his sense of humor. He was full of jokes, some of them dirty, most of them kind of dad jokes. Two great examples actually come from his deathbed. When it's clear he's dying, he says, Why, puto deus fio? Which means, oh no, I think I'm becoming a god. A cheeky reference to the near certainty that he'd be deified after his death. And his last words are, An emperor ought to die standing. Then he struggles to his feet and dies. Overall, Vespasian was a very capable and professional emperor. He was accessible, modest, and took his role very seriously. He maintained his relationships with the senate, the people, and the army very well. At the same time, he put into official law many powers that emperors used to hold only by tradition and at the approval of the Senate, powers that many less scrupulous emperors after him would exploit, including his second son, Domitian. But first, Titus inherits the throne, and Vespasian is deified just as he predicted. Okay, a few questions before we move on to Titus. First, how was Vespasian's background different from other emperors? If you said his family was middle class, you're right. Vespasian and his brother were the first Flavians to reach the Senate. Vespasian grew up in the middle class, not the nobility. Next, which of these things did Vespasian build? If you said the Colosseum, you're correct. Remember that the Romans called it the Flavian Amphitheater after its builder. The Domus Aurea was the pleasure palace built by Nero, which Vespasian had partially torn down to build public buildings on its site. The Temple of Jerusalem and the Fort at Masada were two buildings in Judea torn down by Titus and Vespasian's armies during the Jewish Revolt. 
As we've discussed, Vespasian has two sons, Titus and Domitian. Vespasian gave both the title Caesar before his death, marking them as his successors. But it was obvious throughout their lives that he favored Titus, and Domitian was just a spare. Titus was the one who accompanied him to Judea and became a seasoned general at his side, and Titus was the one who assumed the position of Vespasian's right-hand man throughout his reign. As a matter of fact, Titus's role in his father's administration was often to do the dirty work that the people's emperor couldn't be seen to do. So Titus was very unpopular with many when he took power. He was seen as cruel. But when he takes the throne, Titus becomes a model of the good emperor. History remembers him as exceedingly kind. He banishes informers and refuses to conduct maestas or treason trials. These were the bane of the aristocracy, so he gains the favor of the senate and the upper class. He shows the people his favor in good responses to three disasters that hit soon after he takes the throne. The eruption of Vesuvius in 79, which destroys Pompeii, Herculaneum, and other nearby towns. Then a huge fire in Rome in 80, which is followed by a deadly epidemic. He offers help and charity. He also gets to open the Flavian Amphitheater, which is a great hit with a games-loving population. But Titus dies prematurely of a fever in 81 after only two years on the throne. He's only 42. He is unmarried and has no heirs. He is deified and honored greatly at his death. History remembers him as a beloved emperor, but of course it's easier to maintain popularity for only two years. We'll never know what kind of ruler he might have grown into if he'd lived longer. His last words are a mystery. He said, I have made only one mistake, but no one knows what he meant. Since Titus has no obvious heirs, his younger brother Domitian has a legitimate claim to the throne, since Vespasian made him Caesar. Domitian incentivizes the Praetorian Guard to accept his claim with a large bribe. Now the ignored second son, who grew up in the shadow of a much more famous father and older brother, is emperor. Domitian has a horrible reputation in the ancient sources, because he had a bad relationship with the Senate. He is insecure, verging on paranoid when it comes to the senators he is supposed to share power with. But when it comes to everyone except the Senate, he's an able and fair-minded administrator. He shows genuine concern for the people, the army, and the provinces. He raises military pay and tours the provinces extensively. He doesn't have the kind of military clout Vespasian and Titus did. They both came to the throne with great victories as generals to their name. And to rival them, Domitian has to try to win military campaigns while emperor. He wins some victories in Germany, but he exaggerates these in his triumphs, causing mockery. Later in his reign, a real threat emerges in Dacia in Eastern Europe, which Domitian barely contains. This region will become important in the reigns of a number of future emperors. On the popular front, Domitian is a great lover of games like his father before him. He loves to introduce new things. He adds the tunnels under the Flavian Amphitheater, he introduces female gladiators, he adds purple and gold factions to the chariot races. This, plus his generosity to the army, makes his reign an expensive one, and like Vespasian, he raises taxes and confiscates property to pay for it. But unlike Vespasian, he's not well-liked enough to get away with it. One of Domitian's building projects still stands in Rome today, a huge triumphal arch called the Arch of Titus. It honors his brother Titus's victory over Judea, and is decorated with scenes from his triumph, the one Domitian didn't get honored at. It seems like an attempt for the less popular Domitian to get some of his popular brother's glory to rub off on him. But it's his relationship with the Senate that is his undoing. Remember that successful emperors like Augustus and Vespasian are good at observing the niceties with the Senate. They check in frequently and take their opinions seriously and maintain an illusion of co-rule. Domitian has no patience for this process, and mostly rules as an autocrat. He insists on being called Dominus et Deus, or Lord and God. He relies on informers and treason trials to keep order in the Senate. As his reign goes on, his paranoia grows. Looking for conspiracies is a self-fulfilling prophecy, because the witch hunts and executions breed resentment, which leads to conspiracies. To get by, senators assume a servile role. Domitian's court is full of flattery and yes-men. His most ardent support comes from so-called new men, people whom Domitian himself elevated to power. They owe Domitian for their positions, and he uses them to make sure he always has senators on his side. Many of these ambitious climbers were Domitian's fiercest critics after his reign ended. Tacitus and Pliny the Younger are two notable examples of people who gained power by enabling Domitian, and then claimed that they never really liked him after he fell. Domitian is finally assassinated in 96 CE. The conspiracy that takes him down includes the Praetorian prefects, his palace staff, and his own wife, Domitian. 
Domitian had exiled his wife a few years earlier because of a rumored affair with an actor named Paris, but called her back when the people protested. Perhaps he should have left her in exile. At Domitian's death, the Senate celebrated, the army mourned, and the people were indifferent. The Senate voted on Domnatio Memoriae, removing Domitian's name from his monuments and achievements. But Domitian was almost certainly not as monstrous as the ancient histories paint him. He is hated in ancient texts for two main reasons. First, because these texts were written by the Senate, and Domitian had failed to defer to them during his reign. He was awful to 1% of the population, but it was the 1% who wrote the histories. Second, because he was the end of a dynasty. As I said earlier about Vitellius, if a historian is writing under a dynasty that came to power through the murder of an earlier emperor, that historian is motivated to make that emperor seem like an obvious villain. So Domitian was not a great emperor, but modern historians don't place him among monsters like Caligula and Nero, though ancient ones certainly did. In any case, Domitian's murder ends the Flavian dynasty. Three emperors, a father and two sons, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. The years of the Flavian dynasty are helpfully a palindrome. They reign from 69 to 96 CE. Okay, review time. Match each emperor with his characteristics. And here's how you should have sorted them. I was trying to trick you with that Arch of Titus thing. Did you fall for it? So ends the Second Dynasty in the Roman Empire. The ends of dynasties often cause a period of civil war, but not this one. The elderly senator who takes the throne next is clever enough to avoid this outcome, and he kicks off a series of emperors often called the Five Good Emperors. Prosperity awaits Rome in our next video.